so the Chiefs have already began making roster moves as they shift some players around after rookie minicamp, letting go of a surprising defensive tackle to bring back a familiar face of a linebacker. On top of that, MVS signed with the enemy today. Brett Veach weighs in about some UDFAs he's intrigued by, and we now know who the Chiefs are playing week two. So let's talk about all that and more. But first, how about those all right, first up, after doing a segment yesterday talking about the Chiefs potentially bringing back a familiar face and either McCole Hardman or Marquez Valdez-Scantling, MVS actually visited with the enemy in Buffalo last night. Adam Schefter reported as much around 7 p.m. last night. And then this morning it was announced both sides got a deal done and Marquez Valdez-Scantling is officially a Buffalo Bill. He signed his contract today and it looks like it's a one-year deal worth up to four and a half million dollars and includes a $1.125 million signing bonus. So hey, I'm happy that MBS got another deal even though I'm not the biggest fan of him going to that team. I do think MBS for that price is a fair deal based on where he's at performance-wise in his career. Uh, this makes way more sense than the $14 million the Chiefs were due to owe him if he remained on the roster this season. So you cut him, you save $12 million. Would have been fine with him potentially coming back for a cheap deal, but he is now a Buffalo Bill. And after that announcement, MVS took to Twitter and said, good things happen to good people. Earned, not given, prayers and no shortcuts thankful for the journey. And regardless of what you think about MVS, God knows I was frustrated as hell with that man at times last year. He leaves Kansas City, a two-time Super Bowl champion, and definitely showed up at times in both of those playoff runs. Next up, Adam Schefter recently weighed in about the Rashi Rice legal situation, giving an update that wasn't really much of an update. He said the NFL is certainly looking into these multiple situations Rice has found himself in, from the car crash and fleeing the scene situation that happened the day before Easter, the alleged nightclub assault from earlier last week. And then he even mentioned the incident that allegedly happened at SMU during Rice's college career. And for more on that situation, check out this video here. But basically, Rice is going through it right now, to say the least. And Schefter says the Chiefs are preparing for a multi-game suspension. And he added that there's a real possibility the Chiefs know they will be without Rice to start out the season. And yeah, if his legal issues get worked out before the season starts, the league will most likely suspend Rice this season. And I imagine that's what the Chiefs are bracing for and why I hope to ideally see them sign a veteran free agent here sooner rather than later to just raise the floor of the receiver room overall. But yeah, that's about all the updates we have on the Rice situation at this point in time until more info comes out about the current case he's facing from March, as well as the alleged nightclub assault. From here, I think it's worth mentioning, there is a couple roster transactions that happened for the Chiefs last night as well. First, they brought back linebacker Cole Christensen, and to make room for him on the 90-man roster, they released defensive tackle Matt Dickerson. Dickerson was a bit of a surprise considering he played 190 defensive snaps last year on defense, though he wasn't used really at all in the playoffs. Meanwhile, last week, the Chiefs revoked the exclusive rights tender offer of linebacker Cole Christensen, but Matt Derrick of Chiefs Digest did say that the Chiefs had interest in signing him back to the 90-man roster after the conclusion of Chiefs rookie minicamp and that is exactly what they did. Christensen mainly played special teams last year and then injured his hamstring and was placed on the practice squad injured reserve list returning to play uh, back in December, but then also played a lot of special team snaps during the Chiefs playoff run. He logged 23 snaps alone in the Super Bowl and 54 snaps total on special teams during the postseason. Christensen also is only 26 years old and could once again find himself contributing on special teams in some capacity this year. And then Chiefs GM Brett Veach recently spoke with Pat Kerwan and Jim Miller on Sirius XM's Move the Chains last week. And in that interview, there was a little part that I wanted to talk about thanks to Charles Goldman of A to Z Sports. He highlighted it, but he talked about a few UDFAs currently on the Chiefs 90-man roster that he was surprised to see go undrafted, which means he likes that they were able to get them and then adds at the end here that he could see a way that they make the roster. And those three players he mentioned were linebacker Curtis Jacobs out of Penn State, offensive tackle Ethan Driscoll out of Marshall, and Fabian Lovett Sr. out of Florida State. Beach said they had their eyes on both Curtis Jacobs and Ethan Driscoll nearly pulling the trigger on them in round six and seven. Quote, I think all three of those guys we're excited about, and all three of those guys 
can have a chance to earn roster spots this year. So yeah, that is definitely worth noting. And as a quick reminder about all three of these guys and who they are, linebacker Curtis Jacobs was one of the most surprising UDFAs and one of the highest upside linebackers in the entire draft. His relative athletic score is 8.47. And in 2023, he racked up 49 tackles, nine tackles for loss and two and a half sacks. And he started over 36 games in his college career with his athleticism allowing for quick downhill bursts to shut down running backs. He also played 337 special team snaps, so he's got experience there if the Chiefs see enough in him to add him to the roster as like linebacker five or however many they end up rolling with, with a main emphasis of him playing special teams. And I actually had Jacobs making the roster on my way too early 53-man roster projection from last week, so it's certainly not out of the realm of possibilities. Then, offensive lineman Ethan Driscoll, he is 6'8". 313 pounds with a fifth to sixth round grade on him by Dane Brugler of The Athletic. He started every game the last two years at left tackle, improving every year. And his best path to a roster spot at this point in time is probably going to be a depth piece as a swing tackle. Then, Florida State's Fabian Lovett Sr. He's a 6'3", 316-pound DT. A uh, little bit older of a guy at 24 years old, didn't score exceptionally high on the RAS and can be a bit late to react initially off the jump of a snap. However, he's got strong, large hands, can bully off the line by using the power of his upper body and is a pretty good run stopper, not missing a single one of his 22 tackles in 2023. So he could end up finding his way onto the team as a rotational interior guy, depending on how he does at camp and in preseason. With that being said, do you think any of these guys could crack the 53-man roster? If so, who do you think it is? Make sure to let me know in the comments down below. All right, next up, after it was announced yesterday that the Chiefs would open the season up playing against the Ravens at Arrowhead in an AFC Championship rematch, we found out today that the Week 2 matchup is against another AFC North team in the Cincinnati Bengals. That's right, back-to-back -back bangers, with this game being played once again at Arrowhead on Sunday, September 15th. 3.25 p.m. Central on CBS. And a couple things to note here is that the Chiefs will be playing back-to-back -back home games, and they will be coming off of a mini-buy, is what we like to call it, 10 days or so in between games due to their first game being played on a Thursday. So now that KC knows their first two opponents, they will be ready, especially with the extra rest from week one to week two. Now, will this be an easy game against Cincinnati? Uh, no, it never is. But I do believe the reason why this game is very early on in the season, they typically played much later on in the season against each other, is because Burrow has struggled to stay healthy. And honestly, a ton of quarterbacks got hurt last year, and you missed out on a lot of golden opportunities because of these injuries. I mean, who the hell wants to see Mahomes versus Jake Browning? You? No, you don't. So don't even try to answer that. I don't either. Nobody wants to see Mahomes versus Jake Browning. We want the classic Mahomes versus Burrow back and forth nail biters that end in a three point down to the wire game. At least that's how every Burrow and Mahomes matchup has been so far. Literally every single one of them. To start it off, KC lost three games to the Bengals in the same calendar year, all by three points. First was 31 to 34 in January of 2022, the game where Jamar Chase, good God almighty, he caught 11 passes for 266 yards and three scores, and the game ended in a Bengals field goal to win it all. Then a few weeks later, the Chiefs had a second half collapse with Mahomes playing arguably the worst second half of his entire career in the AFC Championship game, losing by three in overtime at home in Arrowhead. Uh, yeah, I was there, by the way, very fun times. Then, in December of 2022, which was technically the next NFL season, but again in the same calendar year, Butker actually missed a 55-yarder with three minutes left in the fourth quarter. That would have tied the game up, and the Bengals were able to move down the field, move the chains, and ice the game, winning 24 to 27. However, in January of 2023, the Chiefs finally won a game by three, with the end of this AFC Championship game being a doozy. Remember, Mahomes was playing on a sprained ankle, and nearly every receiver on the roster went out due to injury. I'm going off the top of my head here, but from what I remember, Justin Watson didn't even play. He was sick. McColl got hurt during the game, as well as Kadarius Toney, and Mahomes was out there throwing passes to Marcus Kemp, and MVS had the game of his life. Anyway, the game was tied at 20 apiece in the final minute of the game, when Mahomes scrambled up the right sideline, Osai shoved him when he was clearly out of bounds, which led to an extra 15 yards and eventually helped Butker drill a 45-yarder for the 
W. The Chiefs, of course, then went on to win Super Bowl 57 against the Eagles. And while they did play the Bengals again this past year in 2023, it was against Jake Browning due to Burrow needing surgery on his wrist after tearing that tendon in his throwing hand. In fact, Burrow has just struggled to stay healthy off and on throughout his entire career, which has been unfortunate because he's very exciting to watch play when healthy. Doesn't mean I like when they win, just an exciting quarterback, just to make that clear. However, Burrow got cleared for throwing in May, so just within the past couple of weeks, so I hope that he is indeed 100% ready to go by the time week two of this season rolls around. Burrow was recently asked about his recovery, when he'd be ready, completely ready, and his response was he's cleared for everything other than contact at this point in time, but within the next month or so, he should be good to go. He's at a good spot currently and will continue to get better as the off season rolls along, basically ending by saying there's plenty of time to be ready for the regular season. Now, the Bengals, for the most part, are the same team or largely a similar team heading into the 2024 NFL season. They franchise tagged T. Higgins, and even though he wanted a trade, I think he's going to stay a Bengal. Jamar Chase is still there with his fifth-year option getting picked up for next year. Orlando Brown Jr. is still the left tackle. Then they signed veteran tackle Trent Brown to a one-year deal this offseason for the right side. And while wide receiver Tyler Boyd is gone, signing a deal with the Titans just very recently, Cincinnati drafted an absolute dog of a receiver in Jermaine Burton in the third round of this year's draft. They also added offensive tackle Amarius Mims out of Georgia for some tackle depth, though I would imagine he becomes a starter sooner rather than later, even if that's next year. And with Cincinnati losing defensive tackle DJ Reader to the Lions, they did get some defensive tackle help by taking Chris Jenkins out of Michigan in round two and McKinley Jackson out of Texas A&M in round three. Then, with the Chiefs signing former Bengals tight end Irv Smith Jr. to their roster this offseason, the Bengals then drafted Eric All in the fourth, as well as signed Mike Gisecki in free agency to beef up their tight end room. Then, they also opted to release Joe Mixon, actually instead trading him at the last minute to the Texans and opting to sign uh, free agent running back Zach Moss, who was formerly with the Bills, draft pick of the Bills, and most recently played with the Indianapolis Colts. Then, they also added veteran safety Von Bell, Safety Geno Stone signed a two-year deal, and they have some dogs in the secondary already. So, when you look at the Bengals overall, they didn't lose nearly as many players as the Ravens, and will definitely still look to be a tough opponent for KC this year. It certainly is a wild way to start out the season, with the first two games being Ravens, then Bengals. And it did make me blink a couple times seeing both of these teams, the level of competition that they're playing this early, combined with the fact that Rasheed Rice could very well be suspended during these games. Anyway, with all that being said, what do you guys think about this very early matchup between the Chiefs and Bengals week two that normally happens much later on in the season? Do you actually think there's actually some merit here uh, that you wanna try and have these two quarterbacks face off when they are both healthy and that's why it's so much earlier in the season or nah, it has absolutely nothing to do with that. Let me know either way in the comments down below and then tomorrow, Wednesday, May 15th, we will know the entire order of the Chiefs schedule. And before I hit export, uh, I did wanna let you guys know we do know the week seven matchup for the Chiefs uh, and that's gonna be against the San Francisco 49ers Super Bowl rematch that was reported first by Jordan Schultz. So it's gonna be on Fox 425 p.m. Eastern, and Tom Brady is on the call. So just wanted to let you guys know that. I think it's gonna be October 25th, or October 20th. I've seen two different dates at this point, but you got the Super Bowl rematch, Mahomes against Purdy, all that good stuff. So you now know week one so far, that's the Ravens. Week two, that is the Bengals. And then week seven is going to be against the Niners. I think the Chiefs are going to be playing in Germany as well, I believe. So we'll find that out tomorrow, as well as everything else. Looking forward to it. Can't freaking wait. So until next time, let's go. Let's freaking go. How about those? Yeah.